Let's spend some time talking about data modeling. This is a technique that's used to be able to identify the particular characteristics that we want to represent when we're capturing information about a particular organization, say a business. And we're going to introduce a method for data modeling that's called Entity Relationship Diagramming, or ERD. When we're thinking about what data modeling is, it's basically just a way that for us to graphically depict the structure of an organization's data. So for example, if we're thinking about an e-commerce company, we might want to have a way of representing information about customers, information about products, and information about purchases of products by customers. All of those kinds of relationships uh, can be modeled using an entity relationship diagram. And as we'll see in a second, an ERD is particularly well suited to diagramming data that's going to end up being represented in a relational database. So here's some definitions. Uh, of course, we're talking about an entity relationship diagram, so you would imagine that there's going to be entities and there's going to be relationships. So an entity, in this sense, is a set of the things in the application domain. So if we're thinking about uh, that e-commerce uh, idea, one of the entities that we're going to want to model is going to be customers. And it's important to keep in mind that an entity is actually a set of the things that make up the application domain. So when we're thinking about modeling customers, we're not thinking about modeling a single customer. We'd like to be able to capture all of the customers that are of interest in the application domain. So a customer entity is that set of all customers. Now given that, we also are going to want to be able to refer to individual customers or individual instances of that entity. So an entity instance is just one of those things that's in the entity. And again, the entity is a set, so an entity instance would be a member of that set. We also are going to want to be able to describe things about each of the entities, about all those instances that make up the entity. So if we're thinking about a customer entity, we'll want to be able to keep track of things like the customer's first name, their last name, their email address, their credit card number, whatever it is that makes sense for us to be able to keep track of in the application domain. And those things that we track for each of the instances of an entity are called attributes. So they're the properties that are of relevance to us when we're thinking about modeling this particular kind of data. It's also important when we're designing an entity to be able to identify how we're going to pick out a unique instance of that entity. And the way that we'll do that is by defining something called the primary key. So we have this set of attributes that are capturing the specific details of each instance of an entity, that first name, last name, social security number, credit card number, whatever it is that we're, that we're using as attributes for the entity. What we want to be able to do is identify uh, uh, one or more of those attributes that will uniquely identify a specific instance of that entity. So if we're doing an employee database that has to keep track of payroll information, in the United States we might want to use a social security number. We have to have that information to pay somebody, but um, we also know that that social security number in the U.S. at least is guaranteed to be unique because it's assigned to somebody pretty much at birth. Uh, and, and goes with them throughout their employment history. So we could choose to use the social security number as, a, as the primary key for an employee database. Now, <laughs> that has uh, some appeal to it in that it's naturally a, a, a meaningful primary key for employees. It has some issues associated with though. So for example, we know that the social security number is considered private information. And if we were to use the social security number as the primary key in an employee table, we'll find that that social security number is going to be referred to a bunch of other places in the database. It's going to show up in the code. And what we would be opening ourselves up to would be the potential disclosure of that private information to a bad guy or accidental disclosure, uh, a report that included that information that shouldn't, and so forth. Um, so in some cases, although we do have access to what's called a natural primary key, it's natural in the sense that it's part of the application domain, it's not necessarily always a great idea to use that information if other issues come into play like privacy. It also would be problematic if we needed to be able to keep track of people in that database who were not citizens of the United States because they will not be issued a social security number and now we'd have no way of identifying employees that weren't US citizens so that could be problematic as well. 
Another approach to doing uh, primary keys is to simply assign an arbitrary value that is guaranteed to be unique by the database. And this is usually referred to as a synthetic primary key. So it's not natural, it's not part of the application domain, it's just a number that's ginned up by the database management system. So when you add a new, uh, and add a new employee to that employee entity, the database is just going to kind of give you the next number in sequence uh, that will be unique because the database is generating those as you go and will never be reused again within that within that particular entity. And we'll see that for the most part that's the kind of uh, primary key that is usually used in most applications that we'll encounter. It's certainly what we're going to do in here. It's also possible for a primary key to consist of more than one attribute, and we'll see some examples of that later on. But the idea is the same. The goal of a primary key is to have a unique value that identifies a specific instance of an entity, and that could be multiple attributes that taken together would also be unique across all of the rows in that entity. Well, I said all of the rows, I'll explain why in a second, but I mean to say all the instances of that entity. So that's the entity part of an entity relationship diagram. The relationship part is information about how those entities or how instances of those entities are related to one another. And a key element of that has to do with the cardinality of that relationship. In other words, how many of entity A are related to instances of entity B. And we'll see that the way that we keep track of that information has, uh, is, is closely related to the idea of primary keys. So a prim primary key might be the information that picks out a specific instance of entity A, and on in, in entity B, we want to be able to refer to that specific instance of entity A. In order to do that, what we want to do is store in entity B the value of the primary key of entity A. And where we store that is referred to in entity B as a foreign key. So it's an attribute, or it could be a set of attributes if the primary key had multiple attributes in it that captures the relationship by storing that primary key over in entity B. And we'll look at some examples of this that will hopefully make that clear to you. I've already kind of uh, g given this away by accident, but the, there is a very close relationship, as I've suggested, between an entity relationship diagram and the relational database management model. Uh, well, as you're familiar with from previous experience, when you're using a relational database, the contents of the data are stored in a two-dimensional table, right? So down the left side of that table, uh, you have each of the instances of that, of that table in rows. Across the top of the table, you have the attributes associated with the instances of that entity, which we usually call columns. And the entity itself, the set of all of those instances, is called the table. So this is our little secret decoder ring. Uh, when we're talking about an entity in an ERD, we mean a table in a database management system. When we're thinking of an instance, we mean a row of a table. And when we're thinking about attributes, we're referring to the columns within that table. And as I already did previously, I kind of flubbed when I was I meant to say instance and I said row, because I kind of think of those things as synonymous with each other. All right, some of the examples that we'll use uh, in this course uh, relate to a, a, a database that has been out for some while now, and it's a little bit dated in that it has to do with keeping track of rentals of DVDs, which, of course, now nowadays we just stream movies, and I think as of, as of, as of today, there's one remaining blockbuster in the world, um, in, somewhere in Oregon, I think, or Alaska, uh, so this isn't really a thing anymore, but there's a lot of good data that's been created for this example, and I'm just going to use it because it's convenient. So let me take a look with you at a part of the ERD associated with this DVD rental database. So the, the way that we notate these entities and relationships are not particularly creatively, just boxes and lines. Um, Computer scientists have lots of boxes and lines in their in their di in their diagrams. So, for example, here um, let's take the let's take the customer entity here. So this this guy, the entity itself is represented by this box, 
The first row of the box is the name of the entity, so this is the customer entity, and the remaining boxes are the attributes of that entity. So we have a customer ID, and we can see with that PK, that means primary key, the customer ID is the primary key for the customer table. And this is an example of one of those synthetic primary keys that I mentioned before. It's just going to be an integer value that will tell the database management system, hey, when you add a new customer to this table, just give me the next number in sequence so they're guaranteed to be unique. We also have a foreign key in this customer entity um, in the uh, form of the address ID attribute. Uh, so that attribute is referring to an instance of this address table, and we'll look at how those relationships work in a second. And then the additional attributes associated with the customer entity are the customer's first name and last name. Another example here in the ERD for the DVD rental database would be an actor. So we've got an actor entity. It has three attributes, the first name and the last name of the actor, and then the actor ID and that PK again calls it out as a primary key and that's going to be another one of these synthetic primary keys where the database is going to create a new integer value that's guaranteed to be unique uh, for each of the rows in that actor table. All the other boxes on this diagram then refer to additional entities that make up this DVD rental domain. Uh, the lines, by contrast, represent the relationships between those entities and we're going to unpack those in a little bit more detail in a second. Let's take a look at these relationship lines that I just described. And to start with something simple, let's take a look at the relationship between this address entity and the city entity. The idea here is that that city entity is going to have the name of the city embedded within it. That's kind of obscuring it, but see we've got the city going on here. And we don't want to have to enter the same city a bunch of different times in the database because that would introduce redundancy into our data. And if we discovered that we spelled it wrong in one entry, we'd have to go back and check all the other entries. So having less redundancy is always considered good. Um, but we also want to be able to associate an address with the city in which it's located. So here in the address entity, we have the address itself, so, you know, 123 Main Street or something. And then we have a relationship between address and city that's expressed by this connecting line. Now in an ERD, those lines always represent a relationship. We're basically saying that the address entity and the city entity have some manner of connection to one another. Now the line itself just being a line doesn't convey a whole lot of information about what that relationship is. We're just supposed to be able to look at that and go, oh, I see, it's an address in a city, and addresses are in cities, and cities have addresses. So the, the, the meaning of that should be fairly transparent from the fact that those two things are connected, uh, where we don't, for example, connect address and uh, film. Um, doesn't really have anything to do with each other in this context. The things that the uh, relationship lines can do, as indicated by the decorations here at the ends of the lines, is express the number of instances in each entity that's associated with that relationship. And there's kind of two key uh, no notational conventions here. On one end of this line, we have a single stroke. And at the other end of this line, we have this kind of crow's foot notation. The single stroke basically means one of, and the crow's foot means many of. So what we're saying here is that we have, with respect to a city, if we, and this is kind of the silly little game that I play when I think about these relationships. If you just imagine sitting here, that's supposed to be a little stick man, on top of the city relation, or the city, excuse me, the city entity, uh, and look across at the other end of this relationship line toward address, you can see by merit of the fact that there's this crow's foot decorator there, that says, if I'm a city, there's multiple addresses associated with me. Similarly, if I go on the other side of the relationship and imagine myself standing on the address entity and I look across at the far side of the relationship line, it says there's one city associated with with, with me, with the address, which kind of makes sense, right? Because an address is generally found in one city. We would call this kind of a relationship a one to many relationship because I've got one city associated with many addresses or conversely I've got many addresses associated with one city so we could really write this in either direction but normally we talk about it as one to many you could also think about it as many to one
So that's the, the pur- purpose that's being served by that relationship line. It, it gives the sense of a logical connection between those two entities, and it also conveys something about the cardinality, the number of instances on each end of the relationship that participate in that relationship. Let's take a look at this idea of a one-to-many relationship in more detail. So I've zoomed in here on these three tables in the, or these three entities in the ERD. We have the address, we have the city, we have the country. And we can actually see that there's two of these one-to-many relationships represented here. There's the one that we already took a look at, this guy, that says, if I'm an address, I have one city associated with me. And if I'm a city, I have many addresses associated with me. So each instance of the address entity, each row in that table, right, is going to have a relationship with a single city. And vice versa, the city is going to have associated with it multiple addresses. Now, the question comes, well, where do we carry the information about that relationship? How do we represent that in terms of the data model? Um, There isn't anything really in a relational database, although it's a little surprising given that it's called a relational database. There's nothing other than these two-dimensional tables. In other words, there's nothing but attributes associated with entities. And in order to express the relationships, we're going to leverage those attributes to be able to connect together instances of one entity with instances of another. And the way that's being done here in this address city relationship is using the city ID, right? We talked before about how we can have primary keys that uniquely identify a particular entity instance. And in the address table, that primary key is indicated by the PK here is this address ID. Again, that's probably just going to be an integer value that's constructed on the fly every time we add an address to the database. And on the other side of the relationship with city, we also have a primary key called city ID, which is also probably just going to be one of those, um, one of those integer keys that's created for us by the database. And because we have that primary key, it allows us to formulate this relationship between a particular address and a city. So for a given city, city number three, if we want to say that a particular address instance is in that city, we would store the three in the city ID foreign key on the address side. And you can see that this is where we get this sort of many to one relationship. Here on the many side of the relationship, we're storing a foreign key that refers to a particular city on the one side of the relationship. And because these attributes can only have a single value, that means that we can only associate one city with an address. By contrast, if we think about the relationship from city to address, we know that because we could have multiple address instances that all use that same city ID, from the city's perspective, we could say that there's multiple of those address instances that are associated with a particular city that had that same primary key. So we're going to have exactly one place where we're going to keep the information for a given city. It's going to be referenced uniquely by that city ID primary key. And then any address that we want to associate with that city in a one-to-many relationship, one city, many addresses, is going to be done by giving the value of that city in the foreign key of the address instance. Now in this particular uh, snippet of the ERD, we also have a one-to-many relationship going on between city and country. So presumably cities only belong to one country, but one country might have many cities. And again, if you follow my dumb little convention of imagine yourself being a little stick figure standing on top of a city and looking across at the far side of this relationship, we see that there's a one. The single slash indicates a cardinality of one. For if I'm a city, I have one associated country. On the other hand, if you imagine yourself standing on the country and looking across at the other side of the relationship, we see many, which means that one country can have many cities. And we use the same mechanism here. The country is going to have a unique identifier, the primary key, just an integer probably. And any city that's associated with that country is going to have a value for 
country ID, this foreign key with the FK, is going to have the primary key of the country that that city is associated with. So exactly the same mechanism that's being used to connect addresses and cities can be used to connect cities and countries. And again, this is a one-to-many relationship, right? One country has many cities, and one city, or in, uh, many cities can be associated with one country. Notice, importantly here, that um, the whenever we have this kind of one-to-many relationship, the foreign key is on the many side, right? Because in order to associate many, in the, let's just think about cities and countries, in order to associate many cities with a single country, I've got to have the ability to store multiple foreign keys to that country in the city entity. Um, so it's by merit of the fact that I can have multiple instances of this city, multiple rows in that city table when we get to the implementation of this, they can all have the same value for the country ID to say, hey, these cities are in that country, not the other direction, right? So this is a, this is a very important rule to keep in mind, that the foreign key always needs to be on the many side of the relationship. And if we want to sort of look up things in the opposite direction, if I want to say what cities are associated with a given country, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, give me all the cities whose country ID matches the country ID of the country that I'm interested in. Okay? The second thing to, to um, keep in mind, and I alluded to this uh, already, is that each of these attributes, so for all of the attributes, can't really spell, attributes, these are always scalars, right? A scalar is just a single value. Um, we can't have an array uh, value stored in an attribute. Um, we want to make sure that we stick with the notion of an attribute having just a single value in it. And that's one of the reasons why it doesn't make any sense for us to try to capture the relationship, say, between cities and countries on the countryside, right? If we were going to do that, we'd have to have a way to store multiple IDs for all of the cities that are associated with that country in a single in a single location. And that's forbidden by this guidance that says attributes have to be scalars. They can't have multiple values, just one. Okay, I've erased the uh, annotations I've placed on this diagram because I want to talk about one other thing that many people are tempted to do when they start working on database designs and ERDs. I said before that we can only have a single value in a given attribute. So I can only have one country ID here in the country ID. One of the things that people are tempted to do sometimes is to architect this a little bit differently. It, it sort of seems to make sense that when we're thinking about a many-to-one relationship between um, cities and countries, that we might want to store that relationship on the countryside, right? That's where we've got all these relationships. So because we can only have a single value, a single scalar value in an attribute, the temptation is to design a database that might look like this. We've got our country table, our country entity, and we're going to have a country ID because we want to be able to uniquely identify countries like we've been talking about. But then let's say, well, we want to have the ability to do some cities. So we'll say city ID 1 and city ID 2 and so forth to city ID, you know, whatever, 10. Um, so this would be a possibility, right? We could certainly define a table that had a bunch of attributes in it that would let us associate cities with countries. The problem here is that you have a finite number of these attributes that are going to be foreign keys. These are going to, in this design, these would be foreign keys to the city table. Um, you have a limited number of them, which means that in this, in this example, we could have as many as 10 cities associated with a given country, but after we get to the 10th one, then all of these attributes are going to be filled up with foreign keys referring to another city. And let me tell you what, as soon as you get to 10, somebody's going to tell you, well, we need to have an 11th. And once you add the 11th, somebody's going to tell you that you need a 12th, right? So there's no winning this game. You're never going to have enough uh, entries in that table to allow you to have an arbitrary number of relationships, in this case, from countries to cities. Um, furthermore, if you 
over specify this and say put in a hundred different city IDs that are foreign keys to cities, um, maybe it's true that you don't have a hundred different cities in a given country in your particular application. But if you do that, then you're wasting a bunch of space in your database because now you've got a whole bunch of unused places in the database that are never going to actually get valid city primary keys stored in them. Uh, so you're you're shooting yourself in the foot that way. Let me suggest a general principle. And I think this is really important, not just in data modeling, but in a lot of the things that we do in software engineering. And that is that there's really only three important values, zero, one, and infinity, okay? I call this, for obvious reasons, the zero, one, infinity principle. The idea here is that when you're thinking about a design for something, in many cases, you're gonna have, have three different choices. Either there can be none of these things, in this example, we could say there are no relationships between cities and countries. Or you can have exactly one, there's exactly one city per country, or there's an arbitrary number of them. That's what I mean by infinity. Obviously, we can't store an actual infinite number of foreign keys or something like that, but any number more than one, right? If you start hearing from you know your manager, your customer, your users, that we have to have exactly four of these things, right? Well. Uh, four is neither zero nor one nor as many as you want. And you should always be skeptical about those kinds of requirements because they're usually going to lead you in a path that's going to have some sort of a bad outcome at some point. When they guarantee that there's never going to be any more than four, well, some, someone down the road someplace is going to come up with a reason to have five. And now you're left sort of holding the bag, having to go back and make fixes to your software or your database or whatever that are going to accommodate that number. So this kind of an architecture here with the multiple cities in a country violates that zero one infinity principle, right? We're asking for a maximum of 10 cities and that's neither, none, none of those three numbers. On the other hand, if we stick to the convention that I already described that the foreign keys always live on the many side of the relationship as we've got in this ERD, right? This country ID can refer to a country as many times as we want by merit of the fact that we can just add a new city instance to our city entity. So I can have an arbitrary number. In other words, I can have infinitely many cities associated with a country. And that's what we want to have, not have those sort of arbitrary limitations pu pushed on us by an improper choice of database design. Let's look at some sample data that would fit this model just to give you a little bit more concrete uh, picture of what's going on here. Uh, so I'm showing here two tables, the city table and the address table. And these are not all of the fields, but the relevant ones to talk about foreign keys and primary keys. You can see here in my sample city table, I've got the city ID and the city name. So I've given these integer IDs and put in strings for the city names. And in the address table, the interesting part here is the address field. So that's different addresses and their postal codes. Um, and what we've got here are two additional fields. We still have a primary key, right? That address ID that gives us a unique identifier for each of the, each of the rows in this table or the ent instances in this entity. And then a foreign key that has the value of some primary key from the other table. So we're saying here that there's an address 123 main. What city is that in? Well, it's in city number four. So we can go up here and say, there's city number four, that must be in Auburn. Similarly, 42 Peru Avenue is also in Auburn, whereas 1 3rd Street is in city number three, which is Wabash in this database, okay? So the, the database is going to allow us to have as many cities as we want in a given, excuse me, as many addresses as we want in a given city, and each city can have associated with it multiple addresses. Notice something else that the database is going to do for us here. If we were to add an address to the address table here, and we were to put in as a city ID a value that didn't appear in the city table, say we wanted to associate it with city number two, so when we inserted the data into the table, we would specify a city ID of two, and under the current conditions in the database, the database management system itself would enforce re what we call referential integrity. The, reference, the referential idea here is that we're referencing the city table from the address table, and the notion of integrity means we're not going to allow the, the, the insertion of an address with a bogus city ID. In other words, a city ID who d that does not exist in the city table as presently uh, 
constituted. So um, that's one really important capability that relational databases offer to us. They'll enforce that kind of referential integrity. They'll also enforce primary key integrity. So I've been describing the process of adding a new record to a table using this primary key scheme as just having the database generate a new primary key for us. And the default behavior would allow that to happen. It would also be possible for us to specify a primary key to add to that table. Uh, so in a SQL insert statement, we could specify a primary key. And if we happen to give as the primary key for a new row, an existing key, the database will also reject that. So it will keep track of the data integrity in terms of maintaining the uniqueness of the primary key, and it will also keep track of referential integrity in terms of ensuring that an, an added foreign key corresponds to an actual primary key in the related table. And that, that not only happens when we're adding data to the database, it happens in the other uh, operations of the typical create, read, update, delete pattern. So that has to do with creating new records. But if we were to say update a, ta a table entry, if we were to do a SQL update statement on an address, and we tried to set the city ID to a non-existent city, that would also be rejected by the database. Or if we tried to delete a city, from the database when there were addresses that had references to that city, the database would prevent that because it would mean that we would be left with at least one row that had a city ID that didn't correspond to an actual city. So um, among the many amazing things that relational databases do for us is ensure that kind of referential integrity. Now those sort of seem like things that you wouldn't normally want to do, right? put in a bogus value for a city so that you wouldn't have any idea where this address was located. But the fact is that we tend to make lots of mistakes when we're doing programming or, or when we're writing SQL queries. And we don't want to um, allow that kind of bad data to get into the database. And the fact that we can specify when we design our database that there's this one-to-many relationship between a foreign key in one table and a primary key in another, the database helps us by at the sort of at the very last place where we could check for problems, the database itself is going to enforce those constraints so that our, even if our application code or our manual queries are written improperly, we're still not going to have uh, uh, bad data creeping into our database, which is really awesome. Let's look at the other really important type of relationship in a relational model, uh, whether it's an ERD or the relational database itself, and that is a many-to-many -many relationship. So in one-to-many, we had one instance of one entity associated with many instances of another entity and so forth. Um, in the many-to-many -many relationship, we have many of one associated with many of the other. So an example of that from the ERD that we're looking at is this one between a film and an actor. And just intuitively, you could say that the appropriate business logic or the appropriate requirement here from this application domain is that a film should allow us to specify multiple actors because there's more than one actor in most films. And similarly, if the actor is at all successful, there's going to be multiple films associated with that actor. So we've got a many-to-many -many relationship going on between films and actors. Now you might think the way to handle this is to use a similar strategy to what we did with the one-to-many relationships, where on the film side of the equation we could say let's have a field called actor ID and make that a foreign key to the actor table, and that would in fact allow us to associate multiple films with the same actor. On the other hand, we also want to be able to associate um, multiple actors with the same film, so we might be tempted to add, in addition, a film ID here on the actor side that's a foreign key to the film table, and now we can have an actor, multiple actors associated with a given film. The challenge here is we need to be able to have more than one actor in a film and more than one film uh, for an actor. So what the next step might be to have actor ID 1, actor ID 2, actor ID 3, which we already know is a bad idea because it violates the 0, 1, infinity principle. And in practice, we're going to always be asked to have one more actor than we have actor IDs or one more film than we have film IDs. So that is not the way to go about doing this. Instead, what, if we take a step back and think, what are we really trying to capture here? When we're saying I want to be able to have films with an arbitrary number of actors and actors with an arbitrary number of films, 
We're not saying that we want to have a unique foreign key relationship from one thing to another. We're trying to say we want to have a relationship between two independent other entities. So that's the way that we implement this in a relational database. We create this new kind of table. This is called an associative table or associative entity if we're thinking in ERD terms. And the reason it's called that is because it associates together two or more, actually, we're going to stick with two, two other tables. So when we want to associate a film with an actor to say that actor is in that film, what we do is we create an instance of this film actor entity and we put the film ID of the film and the actor ID of the actor in a single instance of that entity, right? So the presence of an instance of film actor or you could think of this in relational database terms, a single row in the film actor table captures the fact that this particular film is associated with this particular actor. Now the fact that I've separated this apart into, into a separate associative table means that I can have as many of those associations as I want in any combination. So if I want to have the same film with a bunch of different actors in it, I would have the, the appropriate number of, of instances of this entity that had the same film ID and different actor IDs. Similarly, if I wanted to think about that as an actor being in multiple films, I would have multiple rows in this table where I had the same actor ID and different film IDs. And the number of associations I can have between films and actors is essentially unlimited. I just add additional in instances of that film actor entity and that associates a film with an actor and vice versa. Now let's look at the way that these relationships are annotated in this ERD. You can see that what we've created here is a pair of one-to-many relationships, right? I've got one film associated with many film actors and many film actors associated with one actor. So I've taken that many-to-many -many relationship that idea that I can have many films with many actors and vice versa, and I've sort of split it apart into two different pieces, one that talks about films and one that talks about actors, and the fact that those two one-to-many relationships appear in the same table is where I get that connection between films and actors. So the, instant, the occurrence of a given film ID and a given actor ID in a single instance of that entity, a single row of that film actor table, is what makes that association. Again, keep in mind that the many part of the relationship always is associated with the foreign key, right? So film ID here is a foreign key. Actor ID is a foreign key. And it refers to the primary key on the single side of the relationship. So the one actor primary key is going to show up over here as a foreign key. And the one film ID, a primary key, is going to show up here as a foreign key from the film ID in the film actor table. So it's two one-to-many relationships that taken together in the same, ent same entity form that many-to-many -many relationship. Notice that the, um, the little dumb convention of having the little stick figure stand on top of a table, I could say, well, how many films, or is, if I'm a film, how many actors am I associated with? Well, if I go look at the other end of the relationship that's connected to film, I find a many. The fact that it refers to a film actor in, or associative entity is, is not relevant here. But what we're basically saying is a given film can be associated with a bunch of these things, and these things allow us to get to actors. So I've still got that same convention uh, where I can say, how many, how many actors do I have if I'm a film? Well, look at the other end of the relationship. It's many. I can have many actors. And the same thing holds true in the inverse relationship. If I'm an actor, I look at the other end of the relationship associated with this construct and I see that there's many of those things that I can participate in. Now the other thing here that's a little bit unusual is that I've annotated these attributes of the film actor entity with two different types of keys. We already talked about how these guys form foreign keys to the actor and the film table and the convention that I use is that when we're referring to different tables I suffix those with a, a numeric identifier. So Foreign key one refers to one table, foreign key two refers to a second table. The other thing here though that's weird is that both of these things are listed as primary keys of the associative entity. 
Remember that we said previously that in many cases, a primary key is just a single attribute of an entity, and that that's probably in many cases sufficient to be able to uniquely identify an instance of that entity. Here, however, because we're gonna have multiple instances of this associative entity that have the same film ID, because we might wanna have a film with multiple actors, and vice versa, multiple instances of the uh, of the associative entity that have the same actor ID, it's not sufficient to use either of those as the primary key, right? Because we're going to have more than one row that have a given film ID or a given actor ID. Instead, and this was something that we talked about earlier just kind of in passing, we can have multiple attributes that together make up the primary key for a particular entity. And what we're saying here is that the film ID and the actor ID taken together are the unique primary key for the film actor entity. Now, we wouldn't strictly have to, uh, to do that if we weren't, weren't concerned about data integrity, which we should be. If we relaxed that constraint and just didn't have a primary key at all, we could still associate films with actors and actors with films by adding rows to this table. On the other hand, what we would be able to do that we probably don't want to be able to do is that we'd be, we'd be able to associate the same film with the same actor multiple times by just having the same film ID and the same actor ID on multiple rows. Well, that might lead to some sort of weird behavior if we're trying to do some statistics or calculations or reporting on who's in what movie, because it would look like the same actor appeared in the same movie multiple times, which doesn't really make any sense. So we can, by designating these both as part of a composite primary key in the film actor entity, allow the database to help us with that problem. Because the database is gonna prevent us from violating that primary key integrity that we talked about before, in this case, it's gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna look at the, at the um, it's gonna look at the combination of those two fields and say, you can only put one combination of those two fields in the table at once. If you try to put in a duplicate entry with the same film ID and actor ID as, a diff as, as an entry that's already in the table, it's gonna raise an error and not let you do that. So this is, um, this is a best practice when you're creating associative tables. Not only do you cr create the association to the, uh, the underlying film and actor tables here with the foreign keys, you're also gonna make those things be part of the primary key to avoid duplicate data in the associative entity. Finally, let's take a look at some sample data that might be used by this portion of the database design. So I've got a table here that shows, shows some films. So they've got sequential film IDs, just synthetic primary keys, Star Wars, Star Trek, and the most excellent Firefly. And then I've got a table of actors. So actor ID, first name, last name. I haven't put in all of the same fields as in the RID, but this is enough to give you an idea of the associations. So uh, again, unique integer values that don't really mean anything other than that they're unique. Uh, actor ID 10 is Patrick Stewart, then Brent Spiner, Nathan Fillion, and Simon Pegg. So what we want to be able to do is capture the notion of which of these actors are in which of these films. And that's going to be the job of this film actor associative table. So each of the rows in this table has a particular actor ID that's a foreign key to the actor table and a film ID that's a foreign key to the film table. And taken together, these two fields form the primary key. Uh, so if we go back here to just look these things up, actor 10, Patrick Stewart, uh, is in Star Trek, right? So actor 10 is in film 2. Brent Spiner, actor 11, is also in Star Trek. So film, or actor 11 is in film two. 12, Nathan Fillion is in Firefly. So actor 12 should be in film three, 12 and three. And then finally, Simon Pegg, who's actor 13, is actually in both Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, he's in the later Star Trek films, but you might want to go figure out where he was in Star Wars. It was a little bit um, obscure. But so actor 13 is in both film one and in film two. So you can see here, we've got a pretty clear example of this many to many relationship, right? These two rows, these two instances, associate the same actor with different films. And these two rows associate the same films with different actors. Furthermore, I can add additional rows to this table to associate any arbitrary actor with any arbitrary film. Notice, though, that because 
again, as I mentioned before, the primary key spans both of these attributes or both of these columns in this film actor table that I would be prevented by the database from adding redundant information about films and actors. So if I tried to insert another instance of actor 12 being in film 3, which is already in the table, the database would prevent me from doing that because it violates that primary key integrity that it's going to maintain for us when we tell it that these two fields taken together form the primary key of the table.